they're not really qualified. Yudhishthira was actually qualified to be a divine king. And so uh, it's just like the, the parampara is passed on directly from the spiritual master to the next uh, disciple who's going to hold the parampara. Uh, for example, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, toward the end of his days, he met with Srila Prabhupada in uh, Radha Kund. And at that time, they, they had a confidential talk uh, that um, Bhaktisiddhanta told Srila Prabhupada, there's going to be a fire in the Gaudiya Math. In other words, it's going to burn down. <laughs> and Srila Prabhupada inter interpreted that correctly to mean that there would be problems with the succession, the guru's succession or the disciplic succession. And sure enough, there were terrible problems. Um, the Gaudiya Math deviated from the Vaishnava philosophy. They appointed a guru by a political means, and within a very short time, that guru fell down. It was a disaster. The institution has never really regained uh, either its unity or its potency. Uh, so the same thing happened in Niskan. Uh, almost exactly the same thing happened in Niskan. And some of the same people were involved that created the mess in Gaudiya Math. So, uh, you know, People who don't learn from history are destined to repeat it, right? So similarly, the, uh, the crown, the Vedic emperor, uh, has to be passed down from the uh, previous holder to the next. So uh, Bhishma remained in his body uh, in order to pass the crown to Yudhishthira. And actually, the recitation of the thousand names of Lord Vishnu was a part of that. It was a part of his advice to Yudhishthir in response to Yudhishthir's questions of how to manage this huge empire. How could he manage it uh, for the actual spiritual benefit of all the people? And we've talked quite a bit about the first few shlokas, the prologue, which are the conversation between Bhishma and Yudhishthir, and Yudhishthir's wonderful questions. So uh, I'm not going to go too much into that. More? Okay. There's a question from Ronald Singh. Can you please uh, lightly comment on the difference between the three lineages? I looked up on Google, nothing really came up. Which three lineages? To wait until which which three lineages are you talking about, Rama? The one we are using versus others. Well, there's so many different lineages. <laughs> um, our sampradaya is known as the Brahma, Madhva, Gaudiya sampradaya. And uh, we're descended from uh, Brahma, Lord Brahma. Brahma is the first living being in the universe, of course. And he is the first also to receive the Vedic knowledge uh, from the Lord. And he passes it down. And then the most prominent Acharya on this planet of the Brahma Sampradaya is Madhva, Madhva Acharya. And uh, then a branch of the Madhva Sampradaya went to Bengal and became the Gaudiya Sampradaya. Uh, Goda is another name for Bengal. And Goda Desh. And uh, of course, Lord Chaitanya also took initiation from Ishwara Puri in that, uh, in that same lineage. So we're disciplic descendants of Lord Chaitanya. I think there's been 33 um, gurus since Lord Chaitanya about 500 years ago. 
So unless he can tell me what other, what other lineages he's talking about, I don't know how to compare it to uh, other lineages. There are four Vaishnava lineages. The Brahma Sampradaya, the Rudra Sampradaya, the Lakshmi or Sri Sampradaya, and the Kumara Sampradaya. And these are uh, the prominent Acharyas in those are Madhva in the Brahma Sampradaya, uh, Ramanuja in the Sri Sampradaya, uh, Madhva, Ramanuja, uh, Nimbarka. Nimbarka in the in the Kumara Sampradaya, but who's in the Vishnu Swami? Vishnu Swami is in the Rudra Sampradaya. Oh, okay. Okay, and there there are four uh, commentaries on Vedanta are known as the most powerful. Uh, so uh, these are very important, and our our sampradaya actually borrows elements of all four of <clears throat> these important commentaries on Vedanta uh, in our philosophy. So. Uh, our philosophy is known as Achintya Bheda Bheda Tattva, which means a simultaneous, inconceivable oneness and difference. Uh, so uh, this is our philosophy, and it's very deep. It's very difficult. Not many people understand it properly. Um, but until he can say what he wants me to compare ours, our lineage to. I don't really know, you know, what to say. There's so many different lineages, you know. Most of them are nonsense, unfortunately. <laughs> Is that it? Okay. Okay, well, let's look at the uh, next ch chapter in Nectar of Devotion, chapter 16. Spontaneous devotion further described. Now remember in the past, in the, the previous chapter, a spontaneous devotion was defined as spontaneous attraction for something while completely absorbed in thoughts in it, thoughts of it with an intense desire of love. So spontaneous attraction, completely absorbed in thoughts, with an intense desire of love for Krishna. And there are two categories. One category is called sensual attraction, and the other is called relationship. So we already talked about sensual attraction last night. Tonight we're going to talk about relationship. In the attitude of the denizens of Vrindavan, such as Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yashoda, is to be found the ideal concept or transcendental concept of being the father and mother of Krishna, the original personality of Godhead. Factually, no one can become the father or mother of Krishna. But a devotee's possession of such transcendental feelings is called love of Krishna in parental relationship. The Vrishnis, Krishna's relatives at Dwarka, also felt like that. So spontaneous love of Krishna is the parental relationship, or sorry, so spontaneous love of Krishna in the parental relationship is found both among those denizens of Dwarka who belong to the dynasty of Vrishni and among the inhabitants of Vrindavan. Spontaneous love of Krishna as exhibited by the Vrishnis and the denizens of Vrindavan, is eternally existing in them. In the stage of devotional service where regulative principles are followed, there is no necessity of discussing this love, for it must develop of itself at a more advanced stage. You see? The, the people who follow the path of regulative principles don't think there's any need to discuss all this stuff. They say, well, you just follow the rules and that's it. And they have a point in that 
uh, just by discussing it, you can't develop these feelings uh, by some mechanical or external process. Hmm? You can only develop these feelings by discovering them within yourself. In other words, they have to already be there. They have to be a part of your eternal identity. This relationship between the soul, the living entity, and Krishna, uh, this is our original identity. So we have to rediscover this original spiritual relationship. And then we can approach Krishna with this particular mood, whether it's parenthood, friendship, conjugal love, servitorship, uh, and uh, also there are innumerable family relations that the different Vrishnis have with Krishna. Some are his sons, some are his wives, some are his 